We're going to start with the so-called missing middle proposal that's being developed by VHFA. Uh, we cut more short on two occasions and our understanding as the program has evolved uh, with more detail and we want to give her ample time as she's the person best suited to propose this is my understanding it's it, it, it what it wasn't in either version of the budget adjustment act uh that the house and the senate passed uh, the governor wanted it there and i think part of the pushback by myself and tom stevens on the house side is we really at that point didn't know much about it to start launching a 15 million dollar program without any legislative review so here we are and the floor is yours Laura, thank you. Welcome as always. Laura, you're muted. Oh my gosh. Uh, starting off great. I just want to ask, I know that you have Commissioner Hanford here too, and I didn't, I don't mean to question the chair. I'm just wondering, um, is he here to speak about something else or might it make sense for him to lead in because this is a governor's proposal. Um, I think I was um, just thinking you would go I, first. I'm uh, happy to jump in. It, I'm Josh not is, sure why else Josh, he's here. Josh is here a lot on various topics, but I really, given the fact that we've cut you off twice, I just would like you to start and tell us about the program. Great, I can do that. Um, my name is Maura Collins. I'm with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, I submitted written testimony last Friday, so that's on the committee's um, website um, under that date. And um, this proposal uh, did come from the governor as a part of budget adjustment. And I wanna acknowledge that that's an unusual step to launch a new program uh, mid-year in a budget adjustment. Uh, I think that Commissioner Hanford can probably speak to the thinking behind that and that um, there were extraordinary circumstances uh, during this fiscal year where housing prices are just going up so fast and furious that um, there, the governor felt like there was a need to address this issue immediately and send a signal to home builders that um, that there was going to be help to support the creation of affordable homeownership homes. Um, when I testified before, I have explained that um, it is U.S. housing policy to fund affordable the creation of affordable rental housing. Uh, to a far higher extent, and that we fund affordable homeownership construction um, to a far lesser degree. And instead, we make homeownership affordable through, some might say, complicated um, tax and financing measures like a 30-year fixed rate mortgage and being able to write off mortgage interest and property taxes on um, our income taxes. So, um, so this proposal is different than um, the existing homeownership tax credit program or really the homeownership support that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has provided in a few key ways. Um, this program is designed to be a supply side um, mechanism where there would be funding to builders and developers of modest uh, uh, homes for purchase so that we could try to get more stock on the market. Currently, there are a lot of very successful down payment assistance programs like VHFAs that's supported through the homeownership tax credit program, but also um, VHCB has um, provides funding to support the shared equity model that a bunch of nonprofits um, administer with shared equity. And they, um, that gives money to home buyers largely to lower the cost of housing and make it affordable. And those resources are perpetually affordable. When we give money to home buyers and ask them to, and give them more and more money and ask them to participate in a broken market, we are not helping them find homes. We are giving them more money to still get outbid with largely. The home buyers that this committee is trying to serve through um, most of its affordable housing programs are all people who need mortgages. 
And just by the fact of needing to have a mortgage, you are at a disadvantage in this housing market at this point, full stop. Um, needing to uh, slow down the process by working through a lender, as well as going with very reasonable lender uh, requirements, such as needing an appraisal um, and um, sometimes encouraging inspections. These things are um, slow down the process and will often put a buyer at a disadvantage because they can only get a mortgage up to the appraised amount and there's not the same kind of cash on hand for that buyer to be able to bid over the asking price. And what we hear regularly is that homes right now are selling for far greater than the asking price in these bidding wars, often going to cash buyers. So this program is attempting to address the problem, not by just um, giving more money to the home buyer, but by trying to incent more modest homes to be on the market. So it opens up the market and creates more opportunities. The housing stock right now is extremely limited. I know VPR just did a Brave Little State podcast on this, and there's been a lot of quantifications of um, just how tight um, and low the inventory is. But I think we can see it both in the number of homes that are on the market, as well as the upward price pressures that we have. So this program is designed to address a couple different things in a really flexible way. For one, there are some communities in our state where it costs more to build housing than that home will be appraised for. And I know you have Michael Monti on, he'll be testifying and um, I don't wanna jump ahead of testimony, but I think he has some real life examples of within Chittenden County where uh, Champlain Housing Trust has had that experience where it costs more money to build than the appraisal comes in for. And so this program would cover that, what we call a value gap, that if it costs, I keep using nice round numbers because I don't do math well on the fly, but if it costs 425,000 to build a home and it only appraises for 375,000, this program would pay for that difference so that a buyer could um, buy the home at that appraised value because they can't buy a home for 425. They can't get a mortgage approved for 425. That value isn't there. It costs our developers that much. It's very real. The land costs, the um, construction, labor materials cost 425. But buy, modest buyers cannot pay for that with a mortgage. So we need to buy down that cost to the appraised value. In so addition, Mark, yep. can I ask you a question at this point, please? I don't mean to interrupt, but um, I, I think a lot of us support the concept here of you know middle income, missing middle, uh, however you want to call it. Uh, but I, essentially, will you at the closing write a check for this amount to uh, seal the deal, to miss the, the missing piece in order to buy the home and closing? That's what VHFA will do with this money? For that piece, um, we would have developers apply to us. They would give us a budget. They'd say what their expected cost of construction is. Um, there would be some limitations on that. We're not going to include the cost of land and some different things. They can only get 35% of their total development costs um, approved. But if it if it gets through underwriting, which I don't want to shortchange, frozen because of, um, then we would provide a guarantee to the builder to say if your home is within these limits and it's a modest home and it's going to um, be priced at this price point, then we would provide that funding late in the game, um, like after the home is built, to cover that cost to the builder. So, so it doesn't need to come in at the loan closing of the buyer, um, but it can. But coming in late in the process would be a goal of ours because that protects the money and then it's less at risk if the construction doesn't complete or there is some kind of delay or the like. So you're saying this is just for new construction? In this example, I'm talking about new construction. I can talk about how it would work with 
acquisition rehab, it would be very similar where a builder would buy a dilapidated home that's probably going to be off the market and um, not and, and need a lot of work. They'd buy that and take on that risk. They would do the renovations needed. And then once it was ready for sale, we would uh, provide that gap financing there. Is there Are there any homes that have value gaps that are existing homes that don't need rehabilitation? or new construction. The vast majority of homes that sell in the market are homes that turn over. And I assume that they appraise for less than what the asking price to, are we not covering those? Is this, in other words, is this only a program for builders? We were designing this to be for new construction or for homes that need substantial rehabilitation. We were not imagining this program as um, buying homes that are on the market that don't need any work because that would just be um, continuing to support an overheated market. Um, if that's something that the legislature wants us to consider, we could look at that. Okay. But really, we're looking at those that need the construction um, touch of rehabilitation or to be built new. Well, I, I mean, I'm just trying to get my arms around it. It seems to make sense that this would facilitate a new home or a refurnished home on the market where the other one just is the status quo of the same house being sold, not a new inventory. But I always ask this question. I mean, if you're essentially writing a check to fill a gap, I mean, it's the same argument you made to us to establish the first home owner down payment assistance program to say, they want to buy, they qualify, they just can't afford the upfront costs of closings and stuff. They need $10,000 more. This may be more. And then we have the VHIP program that gives owners money to do re significant rehabilitation to bring home market. Why do we need a new program? Why can't we bring this program within those? I love the question. Um, so the VHIP program is only for rental housing. So okay. while there is a property owner, ultimately those units that have been renovated are now available to be rented. This is a way of doing a similar program for home ownership, and therefore the owners can build equity by owning that home. Okay. And I the why it's different than the down payment assistance program is that down payment assistance doesn't bring any homes online. I'm just handing people $10,000 and they're out trying to find a place to live with an extra 10 grand in their pocket. That's very different than handing $10,000 to a developer and saying, if you build a home, could you sell it for 10 grand cheaper and, and make it modest and have it be within these limitations? That's doing a very different thing in the market. Okay. Right. Uh, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna talk some this. So Maura, I. I, I get this. I, 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 I understand where you're, we're, we're shifting because this market requires us to be uh, uh, seriously more creative. Um, I, I guess my concern is we're calling this the missing middle, but actually we're targeting it at lower income families. Hundred, we're targeting it to the same family income as the um, homeowner a revolving loan fund that we ha are about to hopefully set up in statute with S210 and, and we have the money for it in DHCD. 120% of area median income is not a lot of money. That is a lower income families. It, I'd be happier with this program if we were really looking at the missing middle. The missing middle is significantly more income than this. So um, that's one thing I'd really like us to address if we're talking seriously about the missing middle. Um, and I, I guess it's hard it's hard to, I mean, it's, I think one of the challenges with this program is it's hard to look at subsidizing people who are making profit out of it. You know, so it's hard, to, it, it's subsidizing the problem and I get it, I, I get it. But it is, I think one of the fundamental challenges people face with this program is subsidizing uh, somebody who's doing this for profit, who's building, who's a developer, uh, who's, 
uh, and we're, I know, incenting them to build not for less because they're building for the same amount of money, but it's a subsidy to them in a hot market. Uh, it, I think that's my challenge here. I, I have heard that. And um, just a few notes. Um, I don't like the term missing middle, but it was the one I was handed. And so I'm using it. Um, and so if we want to put some marketing people on that, I would welcome um, a reframing. Um, yeah. I think I mean, it's I think amorphous and I don't know a data person like me can't handle this kind of vagueness. What's a missing middle of what, right. like, even middle class, middle income, no one can define these things very clearly. Uh, originally this proposal was serving households up to 140% of area median income. And it was through actually the exact opposite point that we heard from legislators that, um, we were told that that actually is serving people who don't need it and that we need to stretch to lower, incomes. So I think that that is an interesting policy debate that the legislature can continue to grapple with. And it, I will say, as a program administrator, that will not change the functionality of this program, whichever income limit you all settle on. And so that is um, a discussion uh, that can continue. There is a federal tax credit program that has been contemplated uh, but has not passed in DC yet. And that sets the limit at 140% of area median income for the reason that you stated. Um, the last point about the uncomfortability with builder profit, I completely understand. This is something that um, we grapple with. I mean, we hand out over $35 million a year in federal tax credits, which is a very valuable resource. And um, there have long been questions and criticisms about developer fees through that program and how uh, much developers should be rewarded to build affordable rental housing. And so we have looked at standards and put limitations on it and checked ourselves against other states and looked at feasibility models of projects and gotten very comfortable with the limitations on developer fees that we have for affordable rental housing development. And that is the same structure and process we would put in place here. There would be limitations on developer profit. Right now, the National Association of Home Builders puts the average builder profit at 11% of a deal. That is for home building. That is lower than our current um, developer fees that we have for rental housing development. And so we would look though to have those kind of limits so that we make sure that this is not a program that is just going to um, provide profit to builders who would escalate prices. We're going to be looking at these pro formas and budgets and how much did it cost to build the housing and limit the subsidy to 35% of the total development cost. That doesn't include um, land prices. So if you overpay for a piece of land, we're not gonna reward you for that. Uh, it also doesn't include the builder profit. And so if you increase your profit, you're not getting more subsidy from this program as a result. So I think we have some protections built in. And the last thing I wanna say is that, um, I earn a profit for the work that I do. I want to be very clear. I cash a paycheck every other week. And at some point, we have to be comfortable with recognizing that it does cost money to show up and do this work. And developers and builders have long been maligned that they are charging an excess of profits and that that is the reason why we have this housing shortage. And I would counter that it is much more nuanced and that we need to look at land use, land prices, lack of building, underinvestment, uh, growing income divide, and many other factors that have also contributed to this housing situation that we're in. Uh, uh, agreed. I did was not meaning to I know. Uh, I, I, uh, I always uh, look for an opportunity to just say, though, that builders are the ones who are going to help us create a more welcoming and open and vibrant Vermont when we have more homes that are available to folks who want to move here, folks who are already living here and are underhoused, are living in their parents' basements, are not able to um, get out of situations that they need to get out of because there's no homes to move to. Right. No. And and the the thing we're grappling with is the the cost of building, which is, I mean, I wish we had more developers, you know, building fast and furious right now. I mean, hell, 
Well, the other hand, we're working on workforce to fill all these jobs to make, to build more buildings. I mean, we're all working towards the same end. It's just, anyway. And that's what I just wanna say, and this was another point I wanna make sure I was clear with you all. So um, in a bit, you're gonna hear from Champlain Housing Trust, and I know they'll be talking about the wonderful success that they've had with their programs. And thousands of Vermonters are homeowners as a result of our shared equity programs, of the great work that they and others have done through the homeownership tax credit program. And we have done a lot that we should we are proud of and should be proud of, and it's great. But when you talk about wishing that there were more builders and developers who were doing this, I think we can get there. You heard from Tom Getz from Summit Properties last Friday briefly, and Julie Ifland, who wants to um, do homeownership construction in Randolph. I have three more um, builders and developers who would love time on your schedule if you had it, uh, who are ready to testify about projects across Vermont. I do think that a program like this would be the carrot that would bring those other builders and developers in to create affordable home ownership. Thanks. I have one more point to make when we get back to my testimony, and then I think you also have others to talk. So let me just, let me just follow let me just follow up, and then uh, we can finish up and move on to Josh. Um, so I've heard a lot of talk about. Uh, perpetual affordability and some give back uh, to for this uh, for this program for these incentives. Uh, I want to hear more about what this program does similar to a shared equity model. I, I'm a believer that if we're giving out incentives, we're also we're, not only are we solving, a society problem. We have a big one with housing here and we're trying to fix that. But the individual, like the homeowner, is getting a big lift getting into their own home and a nice home. And I don't think it's wrong to say if you make profits from that and you sell it, that that could be passed on to the next buyer. In this case, I don't know what exactly is in there. Like we have with VHIP, we have rent to lower income people for a while. Uh, so I'd like to hear more about that and also hear from Michael about how that compares with some of the programs he's worked on. But from a builder's perspective, yes, we need them to build. And yes, we give them this money to incentivize to make it to make the numbers work. But after they're done with the project, do they have any give back for us helping them sustain their business in addition to addressing this societal problem? Uh, there would be no give back to cover that value gap because um, while we are sustaining their business, they really could still build those homes without this program. They would just sell them for far greater money. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, they, you, if it costs $425,000 to build a home, and it only appraises for 375. Right now, they still may be able to sell that home for over 425 thousand um, dollars if if they can find a cash buyer to do so. Um, so. So I mean, essentially, you're saying, and there's no right or wrong here, is that uh, they're helping us more than we're helping them by us giving the program. Uh, I see Josh nodding his head. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, home builders, there are many home builders. Um, in fact, another one, I don't want to speak for other people, but um, I, if there was time for testimony from one, I know who's saying I'm now selling homes for $700,000 and I don't want to do that. It doesn't feel good. It's not why I got into this business. He was telling my coworker, Seth, um, I'd like to get back to selling homes at three and four hundred thousand dollars, but I can't do that right now because I can't build them for that low, and so I can't sell them for that low. Um, I do think that this um, is a program that can help that. But I want to pivot to your question about affordability um, and the permanency of that. Is that okay, Senator Brock? If I yeah, do that, please, before yes. I... okay. sure, go ahead. Um, so that's been a big question um, that I understand why it's been raised. Um, the shared equity program has been 
wildly successful. And this week being uh, the Housing Conservation Coalition week and the kickoff being in a few hours um, of that group, there's been wonderful support for the permanent affordability of the shared equity model. Uh, this program, that value gap, we don't have a way of retaining that investment because it disappears. It costs four twenty-five to build. It's only appraised. The home's only worth three seventy-five. We are not securing that investment with permanency, but we are securing any affordability subsidy that further lowers the price of the home. So if the home appraises at three seventy-five, but then we want to target a median income buyer, and so we only want to sell it for three fifteen that additional $60,000 subsidy would be retained. And right now we are drafting and looking at the model of a land subsidy covenant, which is a similar tool that the shared equity model uses. And um, having that subsidy covenant retain that investment. So what would happen is, is that if I buy a home, I get to buy the home at $60,000 lower than I would have otherwise, because I'm income eligible. I then years from now sell the home and walk away with all of the equity. So this is different than a shared equity program. I retain all of the equity, but I don't get to cash out that $60,000 that lowered the price of my home in the first place. I have to sell the home at a reduced rate. Now, this gets complicated about the income level of the next borrower. Right now, VHFA is saying we will tackle the administration of this to make sure that next borrower is income eligible. But it does get very complicated because if the home appreciates at a faster rate than incomes appreciate, it's possible that that $60,000 five, 10 years from now will mean that that home is no longer affordable to a median income buyer. And um, so that's why the language I proposed talks about using the same idea that we use in the state tax credits, which is for every time that we can keep that home affordable, we will do that. And if it's not possible for that home to still be affordable within these income parameters that you all set, then that subsidy comes back to a pool and we redeploy that subsidy into helping another home. That is similar to how the state home ownership tax credit works now, that there is an option about either retaining the subsidy in the home and having it be a shared equity model where it grows and is successful, or that subsidy gets paid back into a pool that gets redeployed, just like with our down payment assistance program. That money comes back to VHFA and we redeploy it when we get it. So we are retaining the value of that subsidy. There is not a homeowner flipping homes or walking away with public subsidy as a result of that. What the homeowner does get as a benefit is they get to live in that home and earn that appreciation during that time that maybe they wouldn't have other, otherwise been able to buy a home without having that subsidy there. So it might be cleaner to keep the subsidy uh, have it paid back immediately with that initial homeowner and have VHFA or whoever uh, then then keep tabs on that affordability subsidy uh, in a way that will be lost, I think, over time if it's just done in the market. But if VHFA is willing and able to track individual homes like that, uh, it would be it would mean that that affordability subsidy could be applied to every purchase going forward of that home. Here's okay, why Senator I Brock, wouldn't want Senator to- Brock, do... You had a question, Senator Brock? I, I did. And uh, Mara, I apologize. I uh, have missed part of your testimony since I'm trying to be in two meetings at the same time with limited success. Uh, my question is, is this situation that is the driver for all of this is this a situation that is unique to Vermont or is this, as I suspect, a situation that's national? It's absolutely national. And that's why the Build Back Better um, framework had a tax credit for a similar effort. Uh, and my peers in other states, we are all talking about this. I will say that Vermont would be a leader though in actually having an additional tool to address this. There are some other states that have done similar things but a lot of programs, a lot of lawmakers are comfortable with helping the individual buyer 
and are less comfortable with actually moving the market in terms of the home building stock. And so in that way, um, we are doing something unique and it would be definitely something that I think other states would be looking to. I think Commissioner Hanford can speak to the fact that when the governor put this in his budget address, that um, there was a lot of interest from, not a lot, there were a few other states that started reaching out to be like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Tell me more. And I'm getting that similar kind of interest from my peers that lead other state housing agencies. That was going to be my next question is whether or not other states have uh, either A, adopted similar kinds of measures or whether or not there are any other solutions that other states have, have implemented that could also begin to address this problem. We've been looking at that. I'm on the board of a national association of all of the state housing agencies. Maine has a new program that's innovative. It's a much shallower subsidy and um, has such limits on the um, price of construction that can be covered. There's a part of me that is worried that they're not um, being realistic and that maybe they're funding, um, they won't be able to find buyers who can build homes as modestly as they are hoping will come online. Uh, but that's a new program. So there, there is a bit of wait and see there. And we're regularly talking with Maine about um, the development of their program. Uh, and then in three weeks, I'm going to be with all the other state housing agency directors. And this is a topic for our three days together to dig into who's doing what. But I'm, I'm regularly talking with other state leaders to find out California um, and Massachusetts are building programs like this. But California and Massachusetts are very different than Vermont. Um, and we have different, frankly, housing values. The idea of perpetual affordability is not a mantra in other states the way it is here. And so building in that permanency to the subsidy is very unique. Other states are not doing that. They are just buying down subsidy and they're very comfortable with helping one homeowner knowing that th there's some kind of um, provision that they have to stay for five or 10 years. But after that, they're letting that one homeowner be the beneficiary and not expecting future generations of home buyers to similarly benefit. That's a difference in Vermont that our values and, and housing policy have been centered on for so long, making sure that Vermont is affordable for future generations, which is different than what we see in other states. And then home prices escalate and, and housing then becomes out of reach sometimes. Well, I guess one of the questions that, that I would have is, is, is sort of a, an economic projection question of, is this a situation that uh, economists expect to continue or is this uh, in effect a blip that may be COVID related? And then with that question in mind, uh, by creating these kinds of subsidies, do you create a situation that is in effect self-perpetuating in which the market will never catch up to what people can afford because it doesn't have to if it's being subsidized? Well, that's interesting. Um, so I do think that econ no one likes to be perfectly clear about the future, but I do think um, we all know that rising interest rates are coming and that has the potential to um, soften our market some, but softening such an overheated market may bring us back to where we were a year ago, but maybe not two years ago. So, um, it, so I do think that uh, interest rates are going to really impact affordability and uh, home building. The, this is still going to be a fairly modest program, knowing that we have been under building homes by thousands and thousands of units every single year. I don't anticipate that even $15 million investment will impact the market to the extent that um, you're speaking of and that it could create that kind of self-fulfilling um, prophecy. Um, and so I'd be very comfortable with this 15 million. I mean, Tom Getz said on Friday that he's prepared to apply for, uh, I think he said 20 or 30% of this money right off the bat, just in his own developments that he's looking at. And so um, this will not likely change Vermont's housing landscape to the extent that um, I, I think the worry is. I hope it helps. I hope it makes a difference but um, I don't think it's going to all of a sudden depress housing values as a result. Senator Rahm. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. So, I mean, first of all, I just wanna say, I think, I think we misunderstand median. If we start to get to 140% of median income, the difference between 
who has a middle income in this state of $60,000 versus who makes $90,000 is a really big difference in terms of who we're helping. 120% gets us up to $75,000. And with the first time home buyer tax credit, as I recall, in its first year at least, it was helping people buy homes who were at $60,000 of income. And so I just think those are truly the folks who are living here, are renting, and are trying to afford a home. And I wouldn't want to see it go past 120% of median income. Um, so second of all, I just, with any money we're putting into housing in the state right now to developing new housing, I'd also like to hear more about how we're ensuring that it's the right type of growth for the state, that it's on transit oriented, you know, pathways and um, is helping people get to work. Um, you know, I know that VHIP is in, is for rental housing. What's frustrating is a lot of our blighted properties, you know, that we're talking about for VHIP, I feel like would still be great places to invest in, um, you know, creating more ownership opportunities as well in core downtowns and village centers, new neighborhood development areas. Are there any parameters right now around where the housing would be built so that we're not developing on new green spaces where people can't use public transportation? There's several things. First, there are not only state, but local um, planning and zoning that you know discourages development and there are areas planned for growth. And so for any development to be approved, we already have those protections in place through um, the local process. Additionally, VHFA has always, again, $36 million a year, we, we have competitive um, rounds for our funding and we look at those questions to make sure that um, our housing policies are matching what our funding decisions are. So we look at depth of affordability, longevity of affordability, placement, transit oriented, energy efficiency, um, and the like, and we then judge projects accordingly. And so um, I know, I think VHCB was the one touted in it, but VHCB and VHFA's investments overlap considerably. And the Vermont Natural Resources Council has a report that says that VHCB's investments are among the best smart growth investments we can do. Um, and so working so closely with them, I anticipate that this would be similar. The, um, but that's why I proposed some language, you know, the governor's uh, budget request, I think was a, two sentences long and it didn't speak to some of these housing policy priorities. And so what I proposed last Friday and that made it into 226, I think is the number, um, is uh, building out those and saying that VHFA would have a program plan that looked at those issues and housing policies and ensured that investments were made in accordance with those sorts of uh, principles that you're talking about, Senator. That's a great question, Senator. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of killing two or three birds with one stone. And we're talking about, you know, what we can ask of the developers who get this money that helps sustain their business. And we could put a priority on those developments being in the right places as a requirement for the money. I'd be interested in the person who was in last week where you said he could take 30% of the money and use it already. I wonder where his developments are that where he can use it. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are in the suburbs and whether those suburbs are good or bad, I'm not judging yet, but it'd be interesting to know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see this kind of incentive go to non-smart growth areas because that's where I draw the line. I mean, we need housing, but don't, we don't need housing at the expense of everything else. Senator Brock. One thing, though, that I think uh, that puts a, a somewhat of a, I won't say a break, but a control on the concept of, quote, smart growth, unquote, is that we don't want to wind up creating a situation in which we have two Vermonts a smart growth Vermont that is suburban in nature and, and densely packed, and the rest of Vermont, the rural Vermont that uh, uh, people actually live in. Uh, I think that we may need to make sure that what we do is, is balanced in terms of our approach so that we don't leave communities behind. Good point. Uh, okay, so we're way behind time. Uh, 
I know Josh is with us frequently and I want to hear from Michael, but Josh, if you can, you spoke to us a little bit about this before. One question I have for you, and if you could uh, try and uh, limit your testimony to five to 10 minutes or so, that would be great. But when the governor proposed $5 million in budget adjustment and $10 million next year, that is my understanding. Is that is that general fund and uh, is it considered base funding or is this one-time funding? Uh, good morning, uh, Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development. This has always been ARPA funding. Um, why we had a sense of urgency and felt like this would be something that should should move quickly. Um, it's a, you know an investment. We've had um, substantial impact because of the pandemic on our housing stock and our housing prices and homeownership is out of reach. Um, so that has been a proposal um, since the beginning. And the five million in BAA um, was to get this started quickly because we already had developers lining up projects for the spring, and you know um, so many people are demanding us to take action as a state to address this housing need for whatever you want to call it, missing middle, modest. It's it's really meant for folks that are in that um, range of sixty to one twenty, maybe up to one forty. I, I understand there could be a debate about. Um, what is the right limit? I think that the beauty of this program as it's designed is if you're going higher up the income scale, there's less subsidy. Um, that's how it's, it's designed um, and modeled after the federal program. If you are moving into those higher income ranges, you're getting less subsidy because you can afford a more expensive home. Um, and to speak to the comment about the profit, I, I think the challenge is no one's building homes that they can sell for $320,000 because there is no profit to be made. You will lose money. And so they're not building it. These homeowners and developers have no problem selling homes. Um, they're just selling homes for over $500,000 and they can keep doing that. And so the ones that want to participate in this program are raising their hand and saying, we want to build homes for working class Vermonters and not vacation owners and, and wealthy retirees, because um, that is what they're having no problem building. And so the question is here, do we want to subsidize that sort of development to help working class families be homeowners in Vermont? Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, you know, the League of Cities and Towns did a survey. This is their number one issue. Um, you know, I know the, the uh, pro tem spoke at that and said they supported the missing middle housing concept. And, you know, my... Um, larger question here is, you know, is, is this something that we can, um, you know, move quickly and, and, and attach S210, or is this going to go through the omnibus uh, housing bill? And, um, you know, um, I, I think that we have relied on VHFA, the, larging, the largest uh, affordable housing finance organization in the state, um, to develop a concept that will work for the market, and that the, the governor has proposed identified the need and proposed a pilot and a solution to address it. But the reality is we need to work within what the market, what the financial uh, in instruments and how this will work. And VHFA has, prevent has presented uh, the model that we believe will work and that we should, should take action on quickly in order to get ahead of this and to be able to use the ARPA money within the timeframes that we have um, and to address this, this issue quickly. Um, so those would be, you know, my main points. Um, a, a little bit on Senator Senator Brock's question about, you know, what else are states doing, and and that this is a state, a net national problem. But I think our levers in Vermont, um, we don't have that many to pull on. In some states, they're not seeing this level of rise in crisis because they build housing cheaper naturally. Whether it's the permits, the land costs, the labor rates, they're just more affordable to begin with. So. We have to tackle this with this uh, development subsidy side solution at this point, unless you know somehow we changed our our, our approach in Vermont to um, building and construction and, and allowing it to happen with less um, uh, costs associated with, with that. But that's a long, long process that we haven't seen much um, success in. So this is our option that we're left with: is to subsidize the building to bring these homes down to a price that working class Vermont families can afford 
because they want to stay in Vermont, but they want to be homeowners. They should be exiting the rental market to free up those rental properties for lower income folks to be successful as well um, and welcome new uh, families into Vermont. Welcome the, you know, the diversity and the workforce we need, but they are struggling to find a place in Vermont without solutions like this to try to bring more units online. So, you know, my, my plea is that this, this should be moving fast. I mean, we, we have the money, we have a limited time frame. It's not a pressure on the general fund. And the concept is developed with our largest affordable housing finance agency in the state at the helm doing what they've done for 40 years. Um, and so, um, you know, my, my plea is to act quickly on this so we can um, maybe see some homes benefiting from this under construction this summer, uh, but, but the time is slipping. Thank you, uh, Josh. As usual, you're a very articulate cheerleader for housing and that's good because you're the commissioner of housing, so that's great. Um, uh, I Just one question for Maura or for you. Does this require that the financing of the home come from VHFA or could someone go to a private lender? Private no. bank. Okay. No, no tie-in with VHFA financing. Okay. Uh, Senator Clarkson. You're, You're muted, muted, Senator Clarkson. You're muted. I'm trying so hard and, uh, you know, it's a good thing you don't get to hear all the remarks that go on uh, as I listen. Uh, this proposal, as I see, is is hoping with the fifteen thousand that is envisioned to to subsidy to, to subsidize four hundred over four hundred and fifty homes. Is that right? That's roughly what I hear see here. Um, so this fifteen million, um, I, I I I don't think those are. Maybe yeah, you're it, looking it at says, VHIP. Uh, it, it, it has funded, uh, it, so this is what it's building on. What I guess then, what my question is is, what are you? What number of homes are you right. envisioning? Fifteen million right. get, will get us. So I, I see you're you're looking at the past state tax credits to build affordable home ownership right. since we so first what, passed that the production. So this will depend. If we serve more folks at sixty to eighty percent, we're going to produce less homes because there's a deeper subsidy. If we're serving more folks at 100, 120% more homes because it's less subsidy in each home. And I think you know, that gets to also the values of, of how this works with shared equity model and others that you know, some of these other models have a larger subsidy in them. And with 15 million, it's scalable depending on um, the price point and the income of the um, eventual home buyer um, for these homes. I get it, but you came up uh, you came to 15 million for some reason. Is is there an, a number of homes you're hoping? Right. Do you have an objective with the number of homes you're trying to to build and or create for people in in this? As it's, many as possible at the least cost. I mean, where the 15 million came from is as you look back to when the pandemic first started and we started using Corona relief money to instantly do shelter, and then we moved into ARPA. We worked among the whole housing um, recovery group, all the housing agencies, and said, what is our first priority? How is the most vulnerable? Those are experiencing homeless, those at the lower income. And we've already put over 200 million towards that effort. And that was first. Now we're moving into this middle income need. And this 15 million is what we felt we could pull out of the system to support the most vulnerable that we yeah. need to serve. And, and this is what we have at this point to, to dedicate towards this. Right. I wish we had more, um, but this is where, and this is a new program. So if we were to suggest it, I mean, we could use 50 million here, but um, we're starting out with, with a program development to um, get it underway, test it, and, and see if we can gain some efficiencies before we're, we're asking for, for even more funding. And it, that's why it's called a pilot. And uh, you, ha, ha, what's the time frame in which you think you need to see results? So if we if we're looking at a, a report back in by January, maybe too soon, but by a year from the launch, depending on whether it's sooner or later, depending on if we can get stuff in for this summer's construction season. Right. I mean, I think you know the reality is there are developers that are going to build houses this summer. 
Are they going to be affordable to working class Vermonters or are they going to be $700,000 homes? And if we can get this money to the point where we can offer that and say, we want you to commit to building homes that are going to sell for 300,000 now, before you start building them, designing them as a five bedroom home, then we'll get those starting construction this summer. But if we can't have a program to commit to those builds that are being designed and developed right now, we won't have results that for you next, next January. We're clear on what you want. <laughs> Money now. I know. Okay. I got Thank it. You. Thank you, Josh. Uh, let's move to Michael Monty and then we'll take a break afterwards. Uh, Michael, welcome again. It's good to have you here and anxious to hear your Thank thoughts you. on the program as it's evolving. Thank you, Senator, and I appreciate it. And uh, let me say I have a half hour speech. I'll try to shorten it down to five minutes so that you can get through it uh, faster. Um, thanks for the opportunity to testify again on affordable housing. I think I was here a month ago or so ago, and we, we talked about the various benefits of the shared equity home ownership program. I think it's a tried and true program, and it creates lasting benefits for Vermont communities and home ownership uh, for, for Vermonters. Uh, it works. We know it works. Um, uh, and my testimony in early January covered many of the issues that I just want to briefly state very quickly. Um, and uh, just to, as a reminder, Senator, uh, we launched a shared equity program with your help back in the 1980s. And that's, that's, that support has been always appreciated. Uh, the program has created over 1,200 new homeowners. Even though we have a stock of 650 homes, a shared equity model allows that home to become permanently affordable and has never ever lost to the market. Um, the, it builds wealth over the last five years of the folks who did sell their homes. The average was $38,000 that they pocketed and 80% of them went to buy homes in the regular market. Uh, that, is, that is our shared equity model and that, that, that is what has worked. Um, and not only that, but you know, we're serving people up to 100%. Our average is a little less it's never 60%, it's much higher, it's higher than that. And, we're, and we know around the state people are uh, serving people up to 120% using uh, shared equity. Um, and so we did this basically by creating the long-term affordability, by, by ensuring the public investment never gets lost. Um, uh, we could have done more. Um, this is predominantly due to the lack of a good, of a good national program or state program that does what the low income housing tax credit does, which is basically bring in a fairly large uh, dollar equity amount um, and allows for uh, more housing, home ownership. Uh, if, if we had a program like that, more home ownership would have been built uh, historically for the last few decades. We have been able to model that with the new market tax credits, but the, the um, Build Back Better program, which had a national Home Ownership um, uh, Act um, was going to is potentially could still provide that kind of tax credit um, for uh, that I think is trying to be uh, replicated here. Uh, the only issue I have basically at this point um, uh, with that program being used as a model that program was really for very moderately priced homes. It really was for homes that were. Um, remarkably enough, a quarter million dollars in terms of value. They weren't really for substantially priced homes as, a, as an equity, but it was providing a decent amount of money, uh, about a third of the cost of construction to support um, the development of home ownership. Um, so um, um, it's true that the cost of building new starter homes often exceeds the appraised value. And we support the funding of this value gap. We think that there's some value there. We could see in our own program uh, at Butternut uh, Grove uh, in Winooski, for instance, that that would have been a significant opportunity. The, the appraisal value of those homes was 350,000. The cost of construction was 400,000. Uh, and I'm using like uh, more round numbers. Um, and you know we're selling those homes for 150 to 180 thousand uh, dollars, significant, a significant uh, subsidy. Um, and the reason why we're able to do that is in part because of some of the some of the tax credit equity that we have used, uh, called the new market tax credit, 
which is not available around the state. It's only available in very, very specific locations. And we're able to do that in Winooski itself. Um, so, um, you know, we, we do support the notion of, of sort of like the, uh, the programs like the VHFA's down payment assistance program, the, 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 the equity builder program of the Federal Home Loan Bank, um, Senator Ron Hensdale's program uh, for uh, gener a new gen a first generation home ownership. Those, those sort of uh, small amounts of initial subsidy for an individual to help buy a home, an increase in that makes some sense to us as well. So the appraisal gap and sort of this initial sort of dollar amounts that could be used in the market, but would go really far with a shared equity program model um, would be would be a valuable, I think, tools for us to have. Um, we're broadly concerned about creating a dual tier system uh, that, you know, low moderate income people get the shared equity home ownership program. And then somebody who wants to buy a seven hundred thousand dollar home get something, some, a different kind of subsidy. And what does that create? And I think, you have to add, I think we have to sort of understand that question uh, quite, a good, quite a bit, because right now, the, the model program that you have in the state of Vermont, which is replicated across the country and the world right now, is to really focus in on um, 100, you know, less than 100% in Chinning County, because uh, the incomes, and 120% around the state, and to really go to a place where the affordability needs to now support people who could try to afford such an expensive home, I think, gets away from the notion that um, everywhere in my lifetime and most people's lifetimes, people start with start homes that are more moderately priced. And how do we really make that happen? And actually, that's what the shared equity model typically has done uh, for decades now. Um, I also want to say that um, we believe that program works best when affordable housing providers create joint development proposals with uh, private sector uh, developers. Uh, we've done that quite often. And right now we have agreements with Snyder Homes, SDR Ireland, Sterling Homes, and Habitat for Humanity, where we're going in and doing affordable housing, uh, deep, sometimes deeply affordable housing with Habitat, but also creating and seeing the creation of more mod modestly priced homes uh, in sort of joint development uh, work. And so we're, we think that as a model is something uh, that um, you should consider. Now, I was gonna tell you a story about the creation of, of uh, Burlington Community Land Trust. Just give me 30 seconds and I'll do this quickly. When it was created, the city council had Republicans, Democrats, independents and progressives. All four parties supported the creation of, of the Burlington Community Land Trust and the shared equity model part and because it was support for home ownership in part because affordable housing was the, the flag waving thing that, that the progressives and Democrats were supporting. But also because the Republicans believed that when you provide a public subsidy, you needed to capture that public subsidy and make sure it was reused again, that no one individual walked away with a huge pocket of change as a result of that gift. That the public investment needed to be there, but it needed to grow, not diminish. And when you when you don't when you do shared equity, what you are doing essentially is growing the public investment. Our initial public investment now has doubled in value. Our homes become more affordable, not less, over time. And that individual who is able to buy that home again can afford that home again, as opposed to that home coming off the market. The person who was supportive of this, mostly a senator, I mentioned his name to you, at um, Alan Gear, Republican attorney from the new North End saw that the Northgate housing project and their Northgate's across the state was potentially gonna be lost to permanent affordability. Permanent affordability became his mantra. His mantra was valuable to communicate then to the rest of the city. And I think now to the state that permanent affordability was an essential element, essential policy imperative. That if you don't do that, the public investment does get lost. And when you do that, you have Northgate's flipping, people being displaced, and, per, and, and neighborhoods gentrify. If we didn't do this in the old North End for shared equity home ownership, the old North End would now be a very high income neighborhood and moderate income people would not be able to live here. I, I work across from the King Street Youth Center. This neighborhood has permanent affordable housing and it. it's mostly rental, but if it was home ownership and we did shared equity, 
that housing would not have been lost over the last few decades because we would have created that permanent affordability. So I want you to just pay attention to that policy imperative. I think it's a critical issue and we should not lose it, I think, as you sort of develop this program. I didn't, uh, the Northgate situation, that was, that was the state or somebody had to bail out that program after the 20 year lease or whatever. And I think there was, there was VHFA, um, the, uh, VHCB in part supportive, but there was a lot of funds that came to, to go in and bail them out. And uh, I'm not familiar with all the gates around the state, but there were plenty of them uh, where that issue came into play. And that became the reason why people said, when you make the public investment, don't lose it, right. let it grow. So is your, is your message to us, Michael, that the way this program is designed right now, it doesn't provide enough in the way of perpetual affordability. Well, I would, I, I, I would, I, in all, in all fairness to Mara and and Josh, who have done, who are really working hard to try to create, I think, you know, a program that works. I would say, just, to, I would ask you to be careful and watch that uh, as a policy perspective. Uh, I think that becomes critical in your thinking about how it should work. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's what I would offer without getting into the detail of the, uh, right. of the specific, okay, specific. Without, without getting, without getting into the details, is it workable to put uh, a stronger perpetual affordability element or does the whole thing fall apart at that point? Uh, well, in, in my, in my case, um, we have a couple hundred of home ownership units that we'd like to build. We're hoping that we, in fact, we could either create that with uh, Build Back Better National ha uh, Home Ownership Investment Act, if that comes through. Uh, we're looking for sort of a third of the cost of construction to tax credits. When you do that, you have a third comes from tax credits, a third comes from the homeowner with mortgage, and a, you know, and a, and a third from other, uh, some other resources. You could actually build what we have built in Butternut uh, Grove and create three these beautiful three bedrooms, two, two bathrooms, um, homes. Um, they are condominiums. They're not single family homes in a hill somewhere in ten, around 10 acres in Vermont, but they are great homes for people. Yeah. I, and we have, I, we, have, we, have, we have 40 or 50 people who are lined up to buy those 20 homes right now. We haven't even begun to do any major advertising. So, um, I guess where I'm having trouble understanding, uh, I, I think what Mora was saying sort of feels to me like um, the education formula with phantom students there's this mi this missing subsidy that in some ways is not real, it's market driven. So you can't take a piece of that equity because it's, you need the money to build the house, yeah. but it's not there after you build the house. Yeah. So how do you share that? Right. That yeah, I get, well, I, so, so let me just say that the proposal, the part of the proposal that we really appreciate is the distinction and difference between um, you know, as, if you have guidelines that say the price, the, the house has to be moderately priced or moderately sized, you know, um, you know, if, and, and if you're, if you have a home that like that and it, and you try to build it for, uh, you try to build it and it not only appraises for 350,000 or 300,000, but it costs 400,000. I appreciate that if there is a program that supports shared equity programs or others around the state. Uh, the private developers around the state that that gap is real, and that would right. be valuable. Uh, and it's that really, gap, it's really, it's really when you give the money to the homeowner, uh, and you and you create that set of conditions where it gets to be very difficult. I think. Uh, but I think you're onto something, Michael, because I think it's that gap that needs to be uh, set in stone once once the home is built, and we're clear on what that gap is, and then that gap is set as the affordability piece, yeah. the value gap that is then paid back That's to right. the lending institution or whoever's gonna do this and track that house over time because it strikes me that if it just floats with the market, it's never gonna stay permanently affordable, which is critically important. Yeah. And and I, so I think we need to figure out when you set that value gap and that's what goes forward in time in through the sale of the house. I, uh, I, and I just have a question for you, which is, did you just describe a few minutes ago a, 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 uh, a, a, a house that you're able to 
build a, you're basically doing a $250,000 subsidy on a house you're able to sell for 150. You described a, a model where it cost to build 400,000. It was appraised at 350 and you sold it at 150. You guys well, are we're, 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 const we're constructing it right now. So we're not, we haven't sold anything yet. Um, but That's yes, but for this one in particular, that's a huge subsidy. To well, it is a huge subsidy, but what, what we're having is we have, um, you know, and the prices are ranging between 160 to 180 or 190 in that range. Um, but that home now, when that family moves in, will be able to probably afford a home that is closer or less than the rental market. They're now going to be able to build wealth. They're now going to be able to build equity. Right. And, and when they go and sell, it'll stay affordable so that that gap right now but, um, becomes, gets used not just once, but two, three, four times. Yeah, I, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm identifying a gap here of, uh, and a subsidy of $250,000. When they sell that house for, if they, if they buy it for 160, they sell it for 200. They're, they're going to owe more back in a subsidy than they can afford. I don't uh, understand. No. Oh. And, well, no, it doesn't. With our program, it doesn't. It won't work that way. Um, yeah. okay. What will what, what will happen is, is that the the appraisal, let's say, is at three fifty. In five years, the appraisal is going to be worth four hundred four hundred four hundred thousand, just round numbers. They'll get a piece of that shared equity. We'll retain the rest of it to keep it affordable, um, and that's the, that becomes the distinction and difference. So that. The initial public subsidy stays with the home. Right. No, I, I, I get it. I just am so impressed by the huge amount of money that it's you're selling it for so Thank much you. less. I'm, I'm impressed and sometimes not that, not happy as well, Senator, <laughs> that, that the cost of development is so high at times. So. Yeah. Is there any other questions from Michael at this point? Uh, Senator Brock? I'm just, uh, I haven't in, even thought entirely through my question yet, but uh, I'm thinking of just the issue of inflation and the effect of inflation on the increased value of that home over time. And so if you sell that house uh, five, six, seven years later, uh, you're selling it at uh, an appreciated uh, value on the one hand, but the, 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 the value of the money that's been put into the house as a subsidy hasn't changed. And well, as a result, value, the gain is, is, is going to be smaller, isn't it? Well, so over time, our homes become more affordable uh, because as we share 25% with the homeowner, the other 75% stays with the home. So we can show that, in fact, that our homes start at this affordability and continue to get more affordable over time. We're actually able to serve even lower income people. That's why our numbers are at 70, 70 or 80 percent of median income. It's principal because we have these stock of homes that we could sell over and over again. The first time time we buy a home, the numbers are a little higher, uh, but it becomes more affordable over time. Now, the just is remember, that because the increase in value of the home, or is, is a factor, the increase in value of that home over time versus the increase in. Uh, uh, well, theoretically, the entire market is appreciating over time. That's right. Yeah. yeah I'm, the end of, again, uh, over the last five years, the individual is able to, the average pocketed cash has been $38,000. Now that becomes, you know, the, 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 the appreciated value. But again, remember the homeowner is also paying down their mortgage, right? So they're making that, they're making that, that monthly investment in their property. They don't own their property. The bank does. And they're now paying off and beginning to become an owner of the property fully. So that paying down the mortgage, as well as the, some of their the shared appreciation, really puts money into a, a homeowner who was a first-time home buyer. You know, moderate moderate income. Uh, most of our folks are, are, are they are teachers, they're nurses, they're not. You know, uh, they're, they're, they're not people who are. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're not they need to be making money. They need to be credit underwritten. They have to go to a bank, you know, so they are working in, they are working from honors. Uh, and the portfolio of properties that we have right now are single family homes, condominiums, their homes in St. Albans, they are homes, you know, throughout, throughout Chittenden County. So I think, um, you know, and it's a variety of different types of homes. It is not just one type of home. Um, 
And frankly, we, the, the demand is great. The number of folks who want to buy homes because they, they could see this as their way of, uh, of getting out of rental and their way of building equity and wealth. Um, well, you know, you, you've talked about, obviously, this is a serious problem. And this, in, in terms of what's being done, the amount of money is, is almost a drop in the bucket in dealing with it. And it just seems to me that, you know, the problem is the cost uh, of homes. And one question, of course, is, is are we doing enough? Uh, and are we doing everything that we can to address the gap in the first place that's creating the problem, uh, as opposed to, you know, are we really trying to solve this problem, assuming that it is solvable? Well, I, I think I think I think what we uh, we have to do the best we can, obviously. But I, as Senator, I don't think it's a rhetorical question. Your answer, I think there's probably a range of issues, such as uh, you know, good pay, uh, you know, better income, better jobs, you know, highly skilled jobs, perhaps for folks who, uh, you know, who are not going to go to college. A whole range of sort of other things that you need to do in order to create a system and society which has fairness to at all levels. But um, well, I think so also just in terms of the cost angle and, you know, if, if there's anything that's almost a summer study committee or, or, or something is to just deal with that cost gap as to why it costs so much more to build a house in Vermont than it does in, 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 in a number of other states. And we know regulation and, and, and things like that are factors. But uh, the, the real question is, is there more that we as a state ought to be doing? To address the cost angle and to get costs more in line with what people can afford, instead of the other way around. I agree. I I I, I don't disagree. And one of the things we have found is that we are good at certain things, but we know that the private sector does well. And when we partner with them, we're able to work in and do a lot of value engineering and bring the costs down to a reasonable level. Our the private developer folks that we are working with are. Uh, pretty smart and capable to create, I think, decently priced affordable homes. Uh, and we're, but the we're problem having... is, based on what people can afford right now, they're not able to do that. Well, the gap, you know, is, I... the gap is widening now. That's why I asked the question earlier, Mara, is as we look ahead from the standpoint of, of, of the economists looking at where we're going, is this a blip or is this something that's going to essentially go on forever? And we're going to have to subsidize more and more and more and more uh, and uh, I worry about those people who don't qualify for subsidies as to how they afford houses in Vermont today. I don't necessarily have the solution, but I'm just wondering, are we working on the solution or are we nibbling around the edges with subsidies that don't solve the problem? That's um, okay. something I'll, for I'll, us, to discuss, I think, as a committee. Yeah, and, and that's actually, Senator Brock has been my mantra as well in terms of the omnibus bill. We can throw a lot of money at housing. And I do think money is, is probably the king in terms of getting people in homes, but there are policies we could do to lower the cost as well. And that's what a lot of the provisions in this bill are directed at trying to do. But how you characterize it could just, it could be characterized as nibbling around the edges. So I don't, you know, I don't know what else. Uh, we could do some of them will provide more certainty to developers, quicker development uh, and save some costs. But I, we're all struggling with that question. Uh, Josh, go ahead. But I, we really need to take a break. So right. quickly. I just wanted to address Senator Brock's uh, question. There's at least two reports in the last three years that try to answer that exact question. And they're out there. We have VHFA has one, two of them. We've hired outside consultants and it's a whole range of things. It's our land use regulations. It's Act 250. It is added costs for increased uh, public policy goals that, we sh that many people share. We have higher um, energy efficiency standards when you build. We have locational uh, requirements that add costs, but you've taken these on over years and years for good public policy, they have a cost. It's what, how do you value those costs and those benefits the same? So th that information is out there. Um, there's no one lever that you can pull that doesn't create other challenges that makes this all easier. Um, obviously more, fun more funding into the system could get around some of those, but those have been studied and um, 
and developers have responded with what the cost drivers are. And so we'd be happy to share those reports again. Well, I've read some of them and I, I share those concerns, but you know, we're now, we're, I, the question that I, I ask as we look at all of this and the situation we're in is, are we sacrificing the good for the perfect? Uh, we, we set up a system that is great in terms of uh, in environmental restrictions, in terms of review, uh, in terms of, of, of building installation and uh, all of the things that we have in this. And we've created a, a housing market, a housing uh, uh, stock that is that such that nobody in Vermont can afford to buy it in the normal marketplace. And that is not a good place to be. And I, in terms of our concentration on solutions, the solution is not going to be to continually add more and more subsidies, particularly as federal money goes away. And where's the money going to come from as this becomes an ongoing static way that we solve this problem? No. Okay, we're, we're going to end. I, I, I just have one very quick question for Josh. We did our housing tour and we were down in White River Junction or thereabouts. There was some creative developer down there who built these at, very- At Busey. Who built these very tiny units and he got good money for them, but people were willing to pay for it. Very small. Have we seen that happening around the state? Or is that unique to that area? No, there, there's creative developers out there doing that work all, all over the place. There's one in downtown Middlebury happening right now. Um, you know, but the costs are going through the roof. They're able to get a lot of money for those. And, you know, unfortunately, he had another project in White River Junction that was stalled by Act 250. You know, a budding landowner appealed it and it cost him two years of development time and risk and money uh, because it wasn't affordable housing. It was market rate housing. So it couldn't qualify as priority housing, um, even though they were in a designated downtown. Um, some people don't like to see lots of development and housing popping up next to them. And we have a system that has a, a chance to appeal that, that adds cost and risk. Okay. All right. Well, let's take a break.